Hello everybody and thanks for joining my presentation which is on the shake table testing of self-centering concentrically braced frames. I'd like to acknowledge all my co-authors uh, in this paper and the paper number is ID220. Okay, so in this presentation I'll give a brief background, uh, introduce the concept of a self-centering concentrically braced frame system. I'll uh, briefly discuss some previous testing that we've done on pushover testing to prove the concept. Uh, and the main bulk of this presentation is on the shake table test itself, so the preparation of the test and the results of the shake table. And then I'll wrap up with some conclusions at the end. To minimise the residual deformations of concentrically braced frames, the concept of a self-centering self steel braced frame system was proposed by myself, Gerard O'Reilly and Steve Mahan, uh, RIP, and presented at the World Conference of Earthquake Engineering in Lisbon in 2012. The innovative form has the advantage of a self-centering system, namely that the, that the structure itself returns back to its original position after the seismic event, while using brace members uh, to act as the primary dissipating components during the earthquake. Hence the application of a self-centrically and concentrically braced frame could reduce the residual drifts following large earthquake events and make it easier to replace damaged braces. The major differences was between self-centering and concentrically braced frames and conventional concentrically braced frames are the connections and the post tensioning strands. So you see those from the bottom uh, image. As shown in the top image, the beam is allowed to rock around the panel zones and thus damage to beams and column members is avoided. The lateral stiffness of the rocking connection is mainly provided by the post tension strands, which are aligned along the center line of the beams as shown in the bottom left image. On the right, we can see the force displacement response of the different components. So the red plot at the very top there on the right shows the response of the conventional brace member, where initially there's an elastic response followed by yielding and plastic deformation of the brace element. On reversal of load direction, the brace member goes into compression and buckles. The blue plot on the middle right is for the post-tension connection. The initial compressive forces in the post-tension strands restrains the rocking connection to make the self-centering self concentrically braced frame initially behave essentially as a moment resisting frame. During a significant earthquake, the gap of the rocking connection will open and the stiffness of the system will reduce. The gap opening puts additional tensile forces into the post-tension strands, which remain elastic and wish to return to their original length, thus trying to close the gap. After an earthquake event, the strands cause the gap of the rocking connection to close and thus center the frame back to its initial position. The beams, columns and post-tension strands of the self-centering self concentrically braced frames are capacity designed to remain in the elastic range and undamaged under rocking, and the brace members are the only energy dissipating components. With proper brace design, gap opening in the rocking connections will cause plastic deformation of the braces, and thus dissipate hysteric, hysteretic energy. Benefiting from the combination of rocking connection and post-tension strands, the beams and columns are protected, and the residual displacement is minimized under earthquake loading. Thus, a flag-shaped lateral force versus uh, drift ratio a hysteretic curve shown on the bottom right of the slide is expected. The centering concept was proven through static pushover tests conducted by myself and Dr. Gerard O'Reilly at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Lateral cyclic loading followed by the following the ECC loading protocol was used. As can be seen from the, the forced drift plot on the right hand side of this slide, a flag shaped lateral force versus drift ratio hysteretic curve was generally aligned well with the a theoretical behaviour was achieved. Most of the imposed energy was shown to be dissipated by the braces. Further prove the concept of this novel self-centering concentrically braced frame system, shake table tests were conducted in the Dynell Laboratory in the Institute of Earthquake Engineering and Engineering Seismology in the Republic of North, North Macedonia. This is a 5 metre by 5 metre platform. As seen in the images here, a similar system to that used in the static pushover test was uh, utilised in the shake table tests. However, two additional gravity uh, frames were required to support the 20 tonnes of mass utilised at the roof level. Please refer to our accompanying paper for details of the structural uh, design of the, of the test setup. The main objective is using self-centering concentrically braced frames in a seismic zone is to avoid damage of the beams and columns. Therefore, strain gauges were placed on the beam and column flanges to monitor the uh, member yielding, also to estimate the force distribution in the structure during the earthquake. The braces are the primary energy dissipating members of the structure as well as the main lateral resistant elements of the structure and the responses in terms of strain value and elongation were monitored by strain gauges and displacement transducers. 
The elongation of each brace was measured by a linear variation displacement transducer, or LVDT, as shown in the image on the top right. The accelerations at the roof level, post tension strand levels, and table level were measured by accelerometers connected to the beams of the column. The absolute displacements at the upper lower uh, beam levels were measured by linear string uh, potentiometers. The recorded data can hence capture the structural uh, story drift. To measure the rocking mechanism performed, two LVDTs were installed at the top and bottom uh, beam flanges to measure the gap opening, as shown in the photo on the bottom right. LVDTs were also used to monitor movements at the boundary conditions of the test subframe. The tensile forces in each of the four post-tension strands were directly measured by load cells. The shake table displacements and acceleration time histories were also measured by displacement transducers and accelerometers in the three directions that are mounted on the shake table. A 3D, delay, sorry, a 3D laser scanner was also employed to obtain a point cloud survey of the frame before and after testing, as shown, for example, in the image on the bottom left. Ground motion records with distinct characteristics were selected for testing. The time history plots and the elastic acceleration response spectra are displayed here on this slide. The time history of the ground motion 1 is roughly symmetrically distributed around 12 seconds. Using the excitation of ground motion 1, the structure could be considered to suffer two similar events consecutively. Thus, under the same um, PGA, ground motion 1 will introduce more energy to the structure compared to ground motion 2. However, ground motion 2 is a sudden acceleration drop at 10 seconds, which can give the uh, structure a pulse excitation. The frequency content of ground motion 1 matches the expected natural frequency of the test frame better than ground motion 2, but is also more narrow banded. The broader band of ground motion 2 will lead to greater forces and displacement to bands after brace yielding during strong motion. The primary objective of the experimental program is to validate the performance of the self centered system under these constraining ground conditions. It should be noted that the high frequency and low frequency components of the two selected ground motions were filtered according to the shake table technical specifications. The tests were divided into seven series according to the brace pair installed with the final test run conducted without any brace members present so that some characteristics of the self-centering frame could be obtained. Following the first test of each series, more tests were performed with amplitude scale factors carefully adjusted until the brace reached its yield limit state. The ground motion amplitude scale factors were calculated based on the peak strain values measured in the previous tests and the, bra and the brace yield strain. After the yield displacement and the corresponding scale factors were identified, the last test, aiming to impose permanent deformations to the braces, was conducted. The scale factor used in this test was determined according to the target displacement, normally four times the yield displacement, but it also could be limited by the overturning moment capacity of the shake table when the shake table test runs. Observations included that the brace members were significantly buckled during and after the seismic event, the structure returned to the centre position after all seismic events, and no damage was found in the beams and column members. The design concept, the lateral forces associated with the inertia of the roof mass and the deformation of the braces are compared, as shown, for example, in the plots on the left of this slide. The inertia force is calculated based on the acceleration recorded by the roof accelerometer. The brace forces are calculated from the average strain recorded by the strain gauges and the average Young's modulus from the coupon testing. It should be noted that this uh, comparison is only valid when the braces behave elastically and hence only lateral force and the elastic tests were compared. Good agreement was found as shown in the, the example of the, in the lateral force time history comparisons presented here and thus the design is effective. It also validated the recorded acceleration data used to calculate the structural periods and the demonstrated the reliability of the strain gauges on newly installed braces. Uh, in terms of the natural frequency and damping that's presented here on the right hand side. White noise tests were conducted between tests to acquire the fundamental period of the structures. With one test in series, within one test in series, the change of fundamental period mainly indicated brace damage. The fundamental period was acquired based on the frequency response function analysis of the roof acceleration. The fundamental periods of the structure before and after each test series are listed in the table presented here. The natural frequencies, as we can see, range from about 0.17 seconds to 0.25 seconds. By comparing the pre-test values, the periods are found to decrease with an increase in the brace cross-section as expected, so that's going from B1 to B4. 
while the bread, while the bear structure itself, which is uh, uh, run S8, has the longest period. So for the test series two to seven, shown in the table here, the pairs are all found to increase slightly after testing. This uh, reflects the stiffness degradation associated with post-buccal deformations in the brace members and indicates a plastic deformation developed in the braces. The damper ratio ranges from about 2.5% to 6.2%. Interestingly, in test series S8, in which no braces were installed and the frame behaves as a moment-resistant frame with some sliding connections, the measured damping is greater than at 6.8%. The relative changes in damping ratio before and after brace buckling are calculated and listed in the table on this slide. For larger brace sizes, damage to the brace has an enhanced influence on structural damping. The buckling of brace, uh, or sorry, of braces B1 caused less than 10% relative change in the damping ratio, while the damage to brace uh, B3 increased the damping ratio by about by more than 100%. This is owing to the brace strength contribution to the structure as provide as brace uh, three providing more stiffness to, uh, to the self-centering self self concentrically braced frame. So on the left showed the rotation measures of the rocking connection between the beam and the column. The two on the very left are from the testing uh, that employ the ground motion one, while the other two employ ground motion two. As can be seen from the plots, the gap opening was observed and the rocking behavior was achieved. The post-tension strands worked effectively and the gap closed at the end of the tests, which are indicated by zero rotation of these plots. On the right hand side, we have the uh, interstory drift plots from four selected tests. For all of the tests, the residual interstory drift ratios are less than 0.1%, which is less than the residual drift ratio limit of 0.2% suggested in the model code for direct displacement based seismic design. This indicates that even when the peaked drift ratio reached 2.5% and the braces were seriously damaged, the residual displacement of the self centering concentrically braced frame structure be effectively controlled by the combination of rocking connection and the post-tension strands. In conclusion, the post-earthquake um, condition of a structure is important for the reoccupancy of a building, monetary losses and the speed of repairs and modification. The application of a self-centering self concentrically braced frame can reduce the residual drifts following large earthquake events and make it easier to replace damaged braces. Therefore, a building comprising of a self-centering self concentrically braced frame has its lateral load resistant system may be reoccupied immediately after an earthquake and lead to reduced indirect monetary losses resulting from prolonged downtime. Once again I'd like to acknowledge the funding to the European Commission uh, from the H2020 programme, the fund of the uh, SERI programme as well as our project partners. Thank you for listening to uh, this presentation and please do not hesitate to contact me if you are interested in what I have presented today.